Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good evening everyone. So welcome back um, to SID 3019. So today I'm just going to try and uh, push through because I have more slides than last week and even last week we, we were not able to finish everything. Okay. So uh, first off, there's two uh, important slides that was missed from last week. So I'm just going to show them now and probably we can just briefly, uh, I'll just briefly talk about it and then we'll just skip into um, this week's lecture. Okay, so last week what we've looked at is uh, we've looked at um, how you can actually produce peptides and proteins from the chemical perspective and also from the industrial perspective or biological perspective. Now, um, bear in mind that the chemical perspective that was presented um, can either be a small scale in terms of a laboratory um, production or it can also be produced in a larger scale for the industrial perspective okay so it's the same concept but for industrial perspective they use um, like a bioreactor or um, sorry not bioreactor they, they will use a bigger reactor that uh, for that can be used for synthetic analysis or they can use a bioreactor if they want to produce it via uh, biosynthetic pathway. Now, these are uh, these two slides is um, are the examples of what um, technologies are being used. Um, so to say, what can be used once you learn about peptides and proteins? What can you do? Um, where, where, where can what can you do? Okay. So the first one is um, of course because it's related to biology. Um, so pharmaceuticals, the use of for health and well-being is the primary use um, of these peptides and proteins technology. Okay, so the first one um, is a technology provided by uh, Kit Biofarms. So this is actually a real product. It's not just a theoretical uh, perspective. This is what um, a company outside of Malaysia have to, have already established. So the basic principle or basic idea is what also we have touched from last week is that first off, you have your gene of interest. Okay, so this gene will correspond to um, a protein of your liking. Okay, and then this gene will be um, incorporated into an expression vector. Okay, so the word vector is the key terms that um, I've touched last, from last week's lecture. Okay, so you have your gene of interest, you put it in a vector and then you transform the vector, put it into um, a, a microbes, okay, a microbial. So in this case, um, normally it's Agrobacteria to Mephician. So that's the name of the bacteria. Okay, so you put the vector inside here so that now the bacteria or the microbes will have your gene of interest. So this gene of interest can be anything as long as it's um, a gene that corresponds to a sequence of amino acids or a polypeptide. So it can be a protein, it can be an enzyme, um, it can be something that you want to create. Okay, so for example, if you just want to create um, a polyalanine, so five alanines, so you can just put or create a gene with this uh, polyalanine, uh, incorporate it into the vector, and then you transform the vector into a bacteria. And then what does this bacteria do is the bacteria then infects the plant. Okay, so you can read more about agrobacterium to be efficient if you want, but the general idea is that the bacteria um, is the same thing as how um, COVID-19 works. Okay, so it infects humans, it goes into your cells and it, it, it reproduces. So it makes more copies of itself. So similarly, what happened here is that the um, agrobacterium infects the uh, plant okay and then reproduce so it, when when the bacteria reproducing itself it did not just only reproduce um the organism itself but it reproduced everything else including the vector that you have inside the bacteria okay so once this happens is that um normally in the vector there are some information that will promote the production of the particular protein of interest from the gene. So once the bacteria has infected the plant, the plant will produce the gene of interest throughout the body. 
Okay, so on its leaf, on its branches, on its roots, and so on and so forth. And once this um, happens or completed, then you can isolate or harvest harvest your protein of interest, then you will have your products. Okay, so that's one of the technology. Additionally, by looking at more um, a chemical perspective is, sorry, I think this one is, this one is also a, a biological perspective. Okay, it's not a chemical. Um, you can do it chemically, but it's more expensive. So um, because the technology of producing peptides and proteins are very expensive, if you were to do it chemically, it doesn't mean that you can't do it. There are companies that actually do it, but um, to produce it in a large scale, in a mass scale, then uh, biotechnological approach is normally the, the choice. So this is what um, Eli Lilly, uh, a big biopharmaceutical company or pharma company in the world, where they first produce um, insulin to substitute insulin um, excreted or purified from animals. Okay, so initially when insulin was discovered, um, there, there was a, a very high demand of uh, insulin because of diabetes. So um, Eli Lilly, so originally, uh, instead of synthetically producing insulin, as insulin structure, even though for now we looked at it and we say that, you know, it looks like it's very simple. We can probably, probably synthesize it in our lab. But in reality, the structure is more complex than that. Even if you want to synthesize it, it's more complex. So uh, what Eli Lilly did was to use the technology as what I've shown in the previous slide and to actually produce it here. So these are the whole pipeline from um, one to three. So uh, aeration microorganism substrate. So organism here is the organism that contains the vector. Okay, same principle. But what uh, the differentiating factor between those two is that Eli Lilly um, did not produce uh, insulin, the protein insulin from uh, plants. Okay, so they are producing it from cells. So this factor can also be inserted into cells and then these cells will multiply. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, Eli Lilly produced it using E. coli. So another bacteria, but E. coli does not infect plants. So it, it grows in your stomach if you, if you really want to know. Um, so you put the fact vector into E. coli and then you put it back into this bioreactor. See, so this is the bioreactor and then you feed the E. coli with all media, proteins, uh, amino acid, not proteins, probably amino acids, uh, vitamins and whatnot so that it will grow and then it will produce your protein. So after passing through all these steps and then finally what you can get out from there is insulin catalyzed in freeze dryer. So it's a pure insulin product where they can now capsulate that and um, sell it as a product. So those two are the um, um, two examples of how um, uh, this technology of protein and peptides uh, synthetic pathway is currently being used by the industry. Okay, um, so that's that's about it. That's that's all from um, this or last week's lecture. So today's lecture will be about something which is about my PhD project itself. Not not really about my PhD project, but it's related to my PhD project. Um, so if you want, you can quickly just scan the QR code uh, and put the code asynchronous lecture next, next week. So it's a reminder of you guys that we will not have a live lecture. I will post a link, um, uh, a video in Spectrum. Okay, so please use or watch the video from Spectrum because um, as, as you have noticed for the past two weeks, what I'm doing during the lecture is I'm asking you guys to participate using poll EV, right? So I post some questions and then you can participate by answering the, the questions and then I will discuss about it. So if I were to do a, an, a recorded lecture, obviously I cannot do that because if I were to do it, then, you know, it's not a live lecture, so you cannot actually um, do anything about it. So um, what I'm using now uh, or next week is a platform whereby a platform in the spectrum 
whereby I can embed, I can put questions inside the video, and then you can participate by clicking on the correct answers from the, um, the questions. And of course, uh, I will have explanation and whatnot inside the um, platform as well. So uh, please use Spectrum and do not use YouTube to actually watch the video, even though the, the video will be in YouTube. But um, during while watching the lecture, please use Spectrum. If you want to rewatch the lecture, um, then by all means, you can use uh, YouTube, okay? Because they, there will be questions posted in um, the Spectrum that will not be available if you were to watch just using YouTube. All right, so as usual, I will start off with some questions based on what you have learned. So uh, if you just can quickly open your Paul EV app and then key in um, the username, okay, Hadi for art 049. So I will activate the first question. That one is not the first question. This is the first question. IUPAC system recognized 20 naturally occurring amino acids. Among these, which amino acids or acids can produce an ionic charge? So um, I'm hoping that the link is live. Okay, so the link is live. Um, please uh, join in. Oh, somehow it's not. Um, Okay, my internet is slow. Can you guys hear me? Or I'm just talking to myself? I'm hoping that you can. You guys can hear me, right? Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Seems like anyone using Paul EV and it's working? Okay, it's working. It should be working. All right. So um, please, I will give you guys 30 seconds. If nobody actually answers, then I will just skip to the next question. Um, please join in. Nobody's joining in. There's only one response, two response. Thank you. Three, four. All right. Okay. So this type of questions that I will post, um, using spectrum. Okay. If you watch the videos on YouTube, then you will miss all of these questions. So um, if, you want, if you want to have like embedded tutorial during the lecture, then uh, please watch using um, Spectrum. Okay, so um, five more seconds. Four, three, two, one, and zero. Okay, so the correct answer for this is, somehow I cannot draw it here. The answer is all of these. Okay, please recall, um, remember correctly. So what it says here is produce an, an ionic charge. So I'm not talking anything specific about the um, side chain. Okay, remember that is the um, structure of an amino acid. Okay, and then you have your side chain, right? And this side chain are from the aspartic, glutamate, arginine, lysine, proline, glycine, um, and everything else. Now, the question asks which one um, you can produce an anionic charge. So, an anionic charge is a negative charge. Now, if you're looking at the structure, which one can form an anionic charge? Da -da 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 -ding. The answer is everything because all amino acid has a carboxyl group and the scamboxyl groups can form an ionic charge okay so nobody got it right which is fine it's, it's just a trick question right so second question i'm activating it all right which of these intramolecular forces is not present in a peptide molecule all right so which one is not present in a peptide molecule So we have 20 more seconds, 15 more seconds, 10, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, deactivate. Okay, so the correct answer is 
hydrokinetic interaction. Okay. Um, if you recall, if you go back, um, I don't think hydrokinetic interaction actually exists. Again, that, that is a, a makeup answer that I'll, I just put it in. So, um, the, the 63% of you got it right. So well done. So that is the um, correct answer for question number two. Okay. Question number three, uh, let me activate that one. So what is the critical difference between a solution phase and a solid phase peptide synthesis? What is the critical difference? Okay, so the keyword that you need to use is the critical. So the solvents, the protecting group, the limit in the length of the peptide produced, the solid support, or none of these. Six. So I will leave you guys another 20 seconds. Fifteen seconds. Five seconds. Four, three, two, one. All right. So, um, if you recall, okay, the first one. So, the most correct answer. If I were to ask about what is the main one, okay, just one. What is the critical difference between a solution and a solid phase? The answer will be, is what 53% um, of you uh, selected, not none. Yeah? So this one is the second one, the, the D. D is the option. Okay, the solid support. Why solvents? Um, yes, it can be a specific, right? But at the same time, if you were to use the same solvent in the solid phase, the synthesis will still work to a certain degree, okay? It's not the main criteria, but to a certain degree, it can still work. Number two, uh, for example, okay, so the solvents, for example, there is a research article um, um, saying that if you were to synthesize a peptide in a solution phase in an aqueous, okay, for example, um, if you were to produce a one mole reaction, you will probably produce um, about 0 0.7 mole of product. But if you use the same system in a solid phase, but you increase uh, like a uh, hundred fold increase in the number of the reactants, then you can still get um, the same amount of product produced. Okay, it's just that uh, you need to spend more to get the same amount of product. So, but it doesn't mean that uh, if you change the solvent, it will straight away not work. Okay, so it is a, a criteria. Um, it is one of the differences, but it's not the main differences. Yeah, the main difference, not differences, the main difference. Okay, second one, protecting group. Now, uh, this is very unique because yes, protecting group may have um, uh, an important role in differentiating between a solid phase and a solution phase, but there is always a but. If you use the correct solvent, you can actually synthesize um, peptides, a solid and solution using the same uh, amino acid. Okay, again, uh, it doesn't guarantee that you will get the same yield, but it is still possible. Okay, so um, the third one, the limit in the length of peptide produced. Um, for for this answer, um, there's actually, in theory, there is no limit in, in the number of length of peptides, um, regardless of whether you are using a solution or a solid phase. Okay. Uh, theoretically, there's there's no limit. Um, the limitation is mostly on the time it takes for you to actually synthesize it, uh, because solution phase, as mentioned, um, it requires more time, okay, compared to a, a solid phase. But the answer is there. The answer on C mentioned that the limit in the length of peptide produced. So the length itself is not the limitation. The limitation is on the time, okay. Uh, so the fourth one is the most accurate. So solid phase is on the solid support, um, solution phase, there's no support. Um, none of these are actually not right because uh, solid support is the main criteria. You do not use any solid support for solution phase, All right? The last one, number four. Okay, so number four, 
what is the key similarities between the three biosynthetic pathways. So biosynthetic pathway, if you recall, there's three, okay, cell base, cell free base, and then plant base. So what are the key similarities between those three? I'll give you guys 30 seconds to actually answer it. I'm hoping that nobody actually selected D. Okay. But D is just there because I have no idea what else to write. And it's okay to choose E if you don't know, if you don't recall. Okay, 10 more seconds. Five, four, three, two, and one. All right. You want that? Okay. All right, so, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, I thought nobody wanted to, to choose. I am not sure. Uh, okay, so the main, the main key differences is, of course, a vector, okay? But again, um, a cell-free, does not um, does not require to have a vector okay um, but to have a vector is still fine because having a vector if you remember the um, structure of the vector that was drawn it's actually a circular okay or something which is circular in biological terms is actually very very um uh, stable against thermal degradation against enzymatic degradation so if you were to choose um, to use a vector for a cell-free base synthesis, it is still okay. Doesn't mean that it won't work. It will still work, but you know, um, it's more expensive because if you just use the gene itself instead of using a gene plus a vector, then a gene itself will be cheaper. But it doesn't mean that it's wrong. So um, yes, for this one, the uh, most accurate among these is uh, B. Okay. So uh, for the last one, um, if you guys can quickly um, answer this, ask me something that you would like to know. So what would you like to know? You have learned about all this uh, for the past uh, two weeks. What would you like to know now? Or what might intrigue you? Or, or what, what do you want me to explain more? Just quickly um, shoot it up. If there's any, otherwise, you know, I will just accept that uh, my lecture is perfect. Nobody asks anything, even though it's not. Okay. Anyone, anyone wants to ask me anything? I'll just leave this link open so that if you are using your mobile, then you can just quickly use your mobile. Um, so what I will do now is I'll just go through our um, lecture plan. So the updated ones. Now, um, for the past two weeks, we've looked at um, pep, the introduction of peptide proteins in industry. Okay, and we also last week we also looked at uh, the differences between uh, peptides and protein um, synthetic pathway, so synthetic or biosynthetic pathway. This week, the idea is for me to introduce uh, to you about immunology and um, antibody. All right, and then next week we will look at um, the technology itself, which is vaccination technology and rapid diagnostic kit, but um, based on my progress in, in explaining with you guys and including all the questionnaires, okay, if you don't want the questionnaires to be inside the lecture, you just want to focus on everything theoretical, uh, by all means, do let me know. Um, otherwise, we I will stick to this. So I will cancel out future technology, uh, morph peptide, and um, move rapid kit into uh, the following lecture. So next week lecture will be just about vaccination technology because, and, and of course about antibody because I'm sure I cannot be, I won't be able to finish um, the information about vaccination and antibody by just talking in this lecture. So I will move a little bit uh, into next week plus the vaccination technology, how uh, the technology itself works. And then the week after that, we will look at um, rapid, rapid diagnostic kit or uh, what, what do you call it? Rapid, rapid test kit, RTK. Okay, so we will look at RTK um, the week after. And then on week six, if we don't have enough time to actually cover all the lectures, we will do a little bit of a lecture 
and then I will post more quiz. Um, and that's why I said uh, I put it there as synchronous. So I will put more um, questions like what you've seen just now. So um, I know this class should be quite big, but only uh, about 75% actually participated. So next week during the tutorial, so it will be a live lecture and everything will be uh, using poll F, okay, poll, poll everywhere so that you can be involved in the questionnaires. And of course, after that, I will do the explanation as what we did um, like for the past three weeks. Okay, so that's why I said tutorial and discussion. And then on week seven, we will have, uh, you will have your first quiz, um, um, which is under whatever we have covered for the past six weeks, okay? So we will have a quiz on week seven. Um, I'm still in on the discussion to either do a quiz number two, um, a standalone quiz, or it will be in a combination with Dr. Ekramo. So that one is we still um, uh, discussing about it. Okay, and then week um, eight, nine, and 10, which is an asynchronous, I will talk about HPLC, mass spectrometry, and NMR. Um, even though you guys, I'm sure you guys know uh, a little bit or at least know something about HPLC, mass spec, and NMR, uh, but this lecture will primarily focus on peptides because as you've seen, peptides are micromolecules, so you consider it as a micromolecule compared to when you um, when you learn about organic chemistry, the third year or first year, second year organic chemistry, it's more on a small molecule, so the molecules are uh, quite small compared to if you were to um, um, analyze peptides, okay? And then again, we have tutorial two, uh, which will be related to the uh, analysis method. And then uh, on week 12 and 13, it will be again a synchronous, whereby we will have a panel talk. Uh, I've already have someone in mind, so that one will come from a UM staff, which handles a lot about um, commercialization and IP. And then for panel number two, we will have uh, a person from NPRA. So NPRA is our pharmaceutical regulatory um, agency um, to actually um, talk to you about um, the process of validation. Okay, for example, vaccine validation or GMP, which is a good manufacturing practice, meaning that if you were to produce a vaccine, what are the key things that you need to do to be able to actually produce a vaccine? Okay. All right, oh, it won't change. So for today, we looked at part one of all of our vaccination. So how do you actually require, um, oh, not require, acquire immunity? So we all know that uh, if say you encounter a disease, um, after a while you get healthy again, okay? So why do you actually get healthy? Uh, what does your body actually produce? And then if you were to um, encounter the same disease, for example, if you were to, to think about the COVID situation, right? So you might have read in the newspaper saying that um, once you um, say, for example, if you have been infected with COVID-19 um, and then you get healthy, the risk of or the possibility that you will acquire another COVID-19 disease is rather low. Okay, so you might have read it or you might have um, uh, watched a YouTube video or, or listened to a radio or something that mentioned about something like this. If you have uh, acquired COVID-19 and you get sick and then you get healthy and then you might not be able to get reinfected the second time around. So what is actually happened? Okay, so this is what this lecture is all about. It might be a little bit biology, but um, towards the end of the day, uh, it is for me to make sure to, to try and um, make sure that you understand how you can actually adapt this idea of biology and then put, put it in a chemistry perspective. Okay, so vaccine of immunity. So the first thing that you need to know is you need to understand what is the concept of immunity and then what is the concept of vaccination. So those two things are different. So immunity is when, um, I, I'll just read the text here. So a person is exposed to a pathogen, whether symptoms are present or not. So in the same case of COVID-19, whether it's asymptomatic or with a symptom, okay, and will naturally develop immunity against the disease, provided that, of course, you need to be healthy again. So you get sick, um, a virus or something, a pathogen infects you, you get sick, a fever, nausea and whatnot, and then you get, or you might not get anything, 
Okay, for example, if um, someone in your house is sick with a fever, for example, okay, and you are staying in the same house. So uh, by theory, you should get sick as well. Okay, because the virus is there and then that virus is actually infecting um, your family members. So by theory, you should get sick, but you are healthy, for example, okay? So uh, it doesn't mean that the pathogens did not infect your body. It actually did, but your body were actually able to fight um, the uh, pathogen, thus you are being healthy. So that is the terminology of, um, oops, that is the terminology for asymptomatic. Okay, so you are actually being infected, but you do not show any symptoms. All right, so if that happens, then you will develop immunity. So that's the concept of immunity. The concept of vaccine is, um, and of course, the keyword over here is naturally. So it's a naturally occurring process. There's a virus floating around and it gets into your nose, it gets into your lungs and it infects you. So that is naturally occurring. So the concept of vaccination is an induced immunity. Meaning that, um, so, so that's the, the differences. Meaning that you are still exposed to a pathogen or part of the pathogen, okay? And then your body develops an immunity against that particular pathogen or disease. So this is what, um, if, you, uh, if you read a lot about um, COVID-19, this is what uh, Malaysia, the government of Malaysia are trying to do. So um, using Pfizer, or oh, we'll just talk about it um, next week. I'll just focus on um, the theory about vaccination and whatnot, okay? So um, the vaccination, even though it's not coined by Edward Jenner, it actually was first introduced uh, or first practiced by Edward Jenner uh, back in 1500 something or, or 1950 something. I can't remember the exact date, okay? So Edward Jenner was the first person who actually uh, reported the use of a vaccine, okay? And, and in his particular case, he is using a smallpox vaccine against a cowpox disease. I actually got it the other way around. Sorry about that, okay? So he developed a, a smallpox vaccine. So vaccines against smallpox using cowpox. Smallpox vaccine, oh, right, sorry, this is correct, okay? So he developed a vaccine against smallpox using a cowpox disease. I will show you a picture between the difference between a cowpox and whatnot. Now, so over here, I'm just gonna talk to you or mention a brief um, story about what happened or what Edward Jenner did. So uh, a long time ago, okay, so this is a very, very long time ago. Once upon a time, there was a disease called um, smallpox. Okay, smallpox is, uh, I'm sure everybody knows chickenpox, yes? So chickenpox, or in Bahasa, we call it demam campak. Okay, chickenpox is um, whereby you get like a, uh, what do you call it? Um, oh my God, what's the word? Um, pimples, okay, so it, it the smallpox and, and chickenpox, it's like having a pimples. But normally when you have pimples, it will just be on your face. Uh, but what happened here is the disease forms like throughout your body. Okay, you have like a pimple-like symptoms throughout your body. And it's very painful, of course, even if you have a pimple on your face, it's already been very painful. But if you have, imagine that you have it throughout your body. So smallpox is like chickenpox, but smallpox normally kills you. Okay, so it's it's more dangerous than chickenpox. Um, so a long time ago, this disease is one of the diseases that kills a lot of people. So what happened was um, a, um, a sibling's disease called cowpox also shows similar symptoms. Okay, but um, cowpox, as as the name mentioned is more um, prevalent in cows, okay? So in animals, so in cows, it doesn't really infect humans uh, at all. Uh, it does, but 
if you were be infected by cowpox, the symptoms are very, very mild. So you probably have like one pimples and then that's it. Okay, so that is cowpox. So what happened was um, Edward Jenner noticed that um, the people who are actually working with um, cows, they, they, they develop this um, a pimple-like um, structure um, around their hands. Okay, so uh, it's, it's an indicator that, uh, of course, at that time, nobody knows what, what those are. So Edward Jenner thought, huh, it, it looks like a smallpox. So he wanted to try and see if um, something will happen if you actually infect someone who has not been infected by a cowpox. Okay, so meaning that if you have um, someone who works with a cow, okay, a person number one works with a cow and then he developed pimple-like structure on your hands. And then you have someone else who is probably do a clerical work. Okay, so person number two does not work with animals. So he was never exposed to cowpox disease. So Edward Jenner wants to, to see if he managed to um, infect person number two using the pimple-like structure from person number one. Okay, so the idea is um, because he noticed that a lot of people who develop smallpox disease does not come from people who are actually working with animals. Okay, so he kind of like uh, noticed that, huh, um, a lot of people who work with the animals, they don't have smallpox. So that's the, that's the ori um, original idea. So he did this. Oops, what happened? So he actually did this. So he actually um, take the pimple-like structure from the person who are working with animals, so develop this cowpox disease at that time and then put it into another person, a healthy person who have not touched a cow at all. So um, person number two, of course, because um, you are actually transferring a disease, also develop the um, uh, pimple-like structures on their hands. And um, he noticed that as more people being tested and develop this cowpox um, disease, the smallpox the number of people who are actually developed smallpox are actually reducing. Okay, so that is the whole story. Um, so once this happens, smallpox disease reduces. So reduces uh, at that particular time in terms of the number of death. It doesn't mean that you don't develop symptoms, but in terms of death ratio, so the number is greatly reduced. Okay, so this is the, um, the, the first discovery and um, why Edward Jenner actually coined the word vaccine, but it's not vaccination, of course. Um, it's an Italian word, vaccine, vaccina, I can't remember the exact word. Exact word, word, okay? But this is the first discovery of uh, vaccination. And then, of course, being a scientist at that time, Edward Jenner published um, his findings and then other people follows, and then voila, vaccination was discovered. So um, if you are actually like, you know, a person who against vaccination, um, then I'm hoping that this story actually kind of like give you an idea that um, vaccination actually works. Okay, it's not just um, a theory. It's not uh, um, something that, uh, someone or, or the Illuminati, for example, uh, created, it's actually a real life situation. So we have never exposed to this because when we were born, we were already being uh, shot with BCG and whatnot. Okay, so but uh, a long time ago when vaccine was not a thing, so a lot of people died and um, Edward Jenner, the first person who discovered this, managed to contribute to everyone um, by reducing the number of diseases. So these are, this is the concept of vaccination and this is what, um, say for example, Sinovac is using. So the same technology. But we will go into a bit more detail um, next week. So this week we will just focusing on uh, what happened next, okay? So you have put in cowpox in another person and then suddenly that person is kind of like immune against smallpox. Why? What actually happened? So we will go through that soon. Okay, so immunization via the use of whole pathogen 
or its biological component has been one of the most successful public health intervention. So this is um, a whole pathogen is what um, Edward Jenner did. Okay, so he used the whole pathogen from a cowpox in, um, to try and develop um, a smallpox uh, vaccination or immunity against smallpox. Disease that almost gone, for example, smallpox. So WHO declared that it's already uh, being eradicated. So it's no longer um, available or the disease is no longer an issue throughout the world. Okay, polio and measles. So polio, the number is getting reduced. Unfortunately, it's going up again, and then measles. Um, of course, it's 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 like um, um, the mam champa, okay. But it's a family of diseases, but it's not actually um, the mam champa, okay. So these are some of the uh, figures. That one is smallpox. Last, this is the last naturally known smallpox case in the world back in nineteen seventy seven. So nobody have actually seen smallpox since then. Okay, so WHO declared smallpox was eradicated. Uh, polio, for example, it was it was getting reduced and it was reducing. The number is actually being reduced. It's being reduced, but so this is the current data by WHO about polio cases, and you can see here it is still here. Okay, um, probably is a bit blur. Okay, but the date, um, the, the date that I'm circle was 21st of January 2021. Okay, so polio, whereby it's it's very easy um, vaccination. So um, if you have a younger brother or younger sister, so if you go to the clinics, a polio vaccine is a drop. Um, it's a, a oral based um, vaccine. Um, polio vaccine uses uh, inactivated, inactivated polio virus. Okay, so um, the virus is no longer active, so it will not cause you this disease up here. Okay, but unfortunately, um, because there is lack of awareness about vaccination, the disease is going up again. Okay. Similarly, measles, if, if you can see on the graph over here, so this was published by um, um, a Nature. So published by Nature. Nature is one of the most respective journals, um, education, academic journals or research journal in the world. You can see here the rate is actually reducing until 2010. And then now um, it's going up again. Why? Because there are a lot of um, anti-vaccine movement around the world, including in Malaysia. So um, I'm hoping that by introducing uh, vaccination uh, to you guys, you can at least know a little bit about vaccine and at least uh, put a trust, um, put more trust on um, our government and the um, uh, NPRA, okay? Now, so induce immunity via exposure of a person to a pathogen or the like to develop immunity against pathogen of disease. So a traditional way, okay, uh, as per what Edward Jenner did, is to expose a whole pathogen. Um, and of course, Edward Jenner, um, what he exposed the um, the other person is a live vi virus, okay? So Edward Jenner uh, uses live um, cowpox, okay? So he, he was using that. So it's that's what we coined it as traditional. Then, of course, as time passes, we have a more modern technology, okay? And um, this picture image here is to show that originally, or oh, when, when um, Edward Jenner first discovered about uh, vaccination, everybody is doing uh, a lot of research in terms of using a whole virus, the whole pathogen, um, and then you incubate it or you infect it into a human, and then that human, uh, that person actually develop uh, immunity against that particular disease. So that's the first generation. And then as time passes, what you see is that um, we can now identify using NMRs, using all this um, molecular structure determination, you can actually now identify what is the virus, okay? And then what are the components that of the virus that are very critical in function 
Okay. So what are what part of the the virus that uh, has the biggest function, and then you try and use that particular protein that has this function and produce a vaccine. Okay. Why? Because immunity means that it blocks the, the virus from doing whatever it needs to do. So if you identify a function of a critical function of a, a virus, for example, um, a virus normally works by infecting um, other cells. So it gets into other cells. So for example, if this is a cell, okay, so the virus has a receptor, receptor on its surface that binds to one receptor on um, on the cell and then it can go into the cell and then reproduce so it makes more copies of itself okay so that is a one particular function that is very critical for viruses so because of this um, people now can know um, on the surface of a virus there are functions there are proteins for example or, or glycoside um, that have a certain function, a critical function. So we can probably use this and produce a vaccine. Okay. So the next generation is to use a, a protein-based um, component or a sub-component of a particular virus or pathogen or bacteria as a vaccine. So this is kind of like a second generation. And then as we know a little bit more detail, um, you know that uh, to produce a whole, a big chunk of a protein like this, it's very expensive. So can you actually use a small section of the protein to actually produce a vaccine? Okay, so this is what people are trying to do. And then by doing research on this, the answer is yes. Yes, you can. Now what you can do is you can actually just synthesize a small chunk of a big protein of a big virus and then use this as a vaccine. Now the cost becomes cheaper and at the same time, it will work because now you know that what you are giving to the uh, patient or, or a person is exactly what you synthesize. Okay, compare if you were to produce it in, in the bacteria, you can purify it and whatnot, but then what you give is the whole thing, okay, the whole protein. So um, the protein might have, uh, again, I, I, I reiterate, might have some um, side effects that we don't know. For example, allergy, or it might do something else. But if you just use a segment of that particular protein, then of course it won't function. Because again, if you go back to the uh, um, uh, uh, SID three zero two zero, when we are when I was talking about um, enzymes and proteins, so to have a structure, uh, a functional st structural proteins, you need to have everything. So it needs to have. Um, a 3D function, um, three-dimensional um, topology, you need to have uh, an active site and so on and so forth. So if you just take a big, a small chunk of the whole protein, then of course you will not have anything. So it will not have any, have any function. So this is what have been um, used for quite a while. And then the newer technology developed, which is the mRNA technology. So of course you have the DNA technology, but then um, DNA technology um, give about the RNA technology and this RNA technology is what being used by Pfizer. India vaccine. Okay, so this is what um, our frontliner are currently having. So this is basically the idea of um, vaccines. I think I will just stop here. Okay, and um, I will continue this as um, a post, a, a recorded lecture, and hopefully you guys can um, view it from Spectrum. Okay, so thank you so much, and um, that's it. Thanks. Thank you, thank you Doctor.